This video is sponsored by Brilliant. In this month's AI 101, we're doing an overview of popular data sets. As I've mentioned in past AI 101s, the data that we use to train our models is really, really important. So I thought it might be useful to go through 10 popular data sets and explain what they are, what kind of models we use them for, and how you might use them yourself. I also know that I've mentioned some of these data sets in passing in other videos, so if you ever wondered what MNIST or ImageNet was, now you'll know. As usual, if you want to check out the rest of the AI 101 videos, I will include a card up top that has a link to the entire playlist. For those of you who are new here, I'm Jordan and I'm a PhD student who's fascinated by the ways that we interact with artificial intelligence and algorithms on a day-to-day -day basis. Consider subscribing if you want to learn more. So we're going to go through 10 popular data sets that are commonly used either in introductory machine learning classes or as benchmarks for new models. In other words, these are data sets that you would likely encounter on your journey to becoming a machine learning researcher or developer. Now, there are many, many, many more publicly available data sets than this, so we're not going to hit on every data set, but I will include a link to a few references that highlight more data sets in the description. First up, we have the Boston Housing Prices data set. I think I first encountered this data set when I was taking Andrew Nigg's Coursera course on machine learning, and it's really commonly used to introduce people to linear regression, where we try to predict the value of something based on a set of variables. In this case, you can take a bunch of information about the neighborhood that a home resides in and try to predict its price. Now, this data set was collected in 1978, so keep that in mind when you look at some of the variables as well as the housing prices that you might see. Obviously, home prices have increased since then, and having a variable that's just the percentage of black people who live in that neighborhood probably wouldn't go over super well now. However, a lot of other information in this data set, such as the proximity to the Charles River and the student to teacher ratio in the area for schools, is still commonly used to evaluate how much a home is worth. There are only 502 homes represented by this data set, so this is a pretty small data set, all things considered, but that can make it pretty good for introductory machine learning because it's something that you can work with on something like your laptop. Our second data set is often the next step for people in introductory machine learning classes, and that is the IRIS data set. This data set contains information about a collection of iris flowers that can be categorized into three different subtypes based on data like their petal width. Similarly to the Boston Housing Prices data set, this is also a pretty small data set containing only 150 examples evenly split between the three categories. Given that, this can be a good starter data set for moving from linear regression to linear classification. In fact, one of the classes of flowers is linearly separable from the other two, which means that you could perfectly separate them if you were only trying to predict whether a flower was or was not that type of iris. And the other two classes are not linearly separable, so this can be a good introduction to separation. Our third data set is the Wisconsin Breast Cancer data set. This data set was created by analyzing cells from patients who were suspected to have breast cancer. It contains information such as the radius, smoothness, and perimeter of the cell, which you can use to predict whether or not the cell itself was cancerous. It's a bit more challenging to classify this one, but it is still comparably small, with only 569 examples. So again, another good one that I've seen in a lot of introductory machine learning classes and that I've played with myself. Fourth, we have a data set that I've definitely referenced before in videos and is one of the first data sets that you usually see when you're going from linear classifiers to convolutional neural networks, and that is MNIST. MNIST stands for the Modified National Institute of Standards and Technology Database and is a collection of handwritten digits from 0 to 9. As we discussed in the neural networks tutorial, convolutional neural networks are good at identifying spatial patterns in your data, which can be extremely useful in imaging. And while you could transform these images into vectors and train a linear model on them, your accuracy will greatly improve with convolution. Each image is 28 by 28 pixels in grayscale, which also lets us train models relatively quickly, especially compared to some of the image datasets that we'll talk about a little bit later in this video. Now, because MNIST is used so often, researchers also developed an alternative data set called Fashion MNIST. In fact, this was the data set that we used to train our neural network in the neural network tutorial. Fashion MNIST is comprised of 28 by 28 pixel images of 10 different types of clothing, from shoes to shirts to pants. And you can perform the same tasks with Fashion MNIST as you can with normal MNIST. The interesting thing about this data set is that there's actually a bit more spatial variance due to things like patterns on shirts, so it makes it a little bit more challenging to classify. Our sixth data set, and what I would say is probably the last data set that you could reasonably train on your own computer, is CIFAR-10. 
This is a Canadian data set that contains 60,000 images across 10 different classes. The images are of a lower resolution than something like ImageNet, which we'll discuss next at 32 by 32 pixels, making it still easy to do this on your laptop. In fact, CIFAR 10 is particularly useful if you want to try a bunch of different models on something more complex than an MNIST, but you want to do it relatively quickly. Now we'll move on to the larger data sets that are usually used to benchmark models, starting with ImageNet. ImageNet is a massive image database that contains over 14 million labeled images. In fact, every image has up to three labels describing what is in the image that have been chosen by a human being, and some images even have bounding boxes that tell a model where exactly in the image each object is. The labeling is crowdsourced, and there is an annual competition for researchers to develop models that beat the current accuracy, which is currently over 95%. ImageNet has also been subject to some controversy due to some issues regarding bias. In the past, models trained on ImageNet have labeled people with racial slurs or otherwise derogatory terms. However, researchers are currently working to improve the labeling system and expand the database to be more inclusive in order to prevent this issue in the future. A newer but interesting dataset for image and video classification is the YouTube 8M dataset. This is a massive dataset of almost 8 million videos and thousands of labels. It's honestly an unwieldy dataset unless you can store it in the cloud or have a computer that has a lot of storage space. The whole dataset is several terabytes, so it's not really something that you're going to be downloading to a local computer. However, it's definitely an interesting and relatively new dataset, so I'm pretty excited to see how people use it. In fact, Kaggle has had multiple competitions to create automated labeling and classification systems for YouTube videos. Maybe someone will end up replicating the YouTube algorithm with all of this information. Our last two datasets will focus on natural language processing, starting with everyone's favorite social media platform, Twitter. This is the Sentiment 140 database, which was collected by Stanford graduate students in order to analyze sentiment in tweets. You can download this dataset and use it as long as you cite them, and the tweets have been classified as either expressing positive, neutral, or negative sentiment. Interestingly, this is one of the few non-human labeled datasets. The classification was performed by looking at the emojis present in the image. So a tweet with a smiley face would be classified as positive, whereas a tweet with a frowny face would be classified as negative. Finally, our last dataset is called 20 News Groups. I first encountered this dataset when I was learning to do topic modeling for a class, where you develop models that can categorize news articles based on the text. It contains 20,000 different pieces of text in 20 different categories. It's a particularly interesting data set because some of the topics are very closely related. For example, there's a category for Mac hardware and a category for PC hardware, and I can only imagine how much overlap there is between those two categories. It's also not a huge data set in terms of the amount of space it takes up, even though it provides a lot of information and a good number of training examples. So it's something that you could definitely play with either on your laptop or in something like Google Collab. And that's an overview of some of the most popular machine learning data sets. Now that you have a lay of the land, you might be interested in developing your own models to train on these data sets, especially if you watched the last AO 101 on developing your own neural network. In my experience, the best way to do this is to try your hand at it yourself, and Brilliant offers an amazing introduction to neural networks that will take you from no coding experience to classifying MNIST. Their step-by-step -step guides will take you from basic concepts to a deep understanding of not just how to make a machine learning model that works, but the math behind why it works. And once you finish those courses, you might check out some of Brilliant's many other courses. I'm personally looking forward to the one on quantum computing, since that's a field I'd love to get more involved in and make more videos about. To get started, go to brilliant.org slash Jordan and sign up for free. In fact, the first 200 people that go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. I've been really impressed by their courses. They teach you to think like an engineer by letting you make mistakes and then learn from them with detailed explanations, so please check them out. Thanks for watching! If you like this video, you can let me know by smashing that like button and subscribing to my channel over here. You can also check out the rest of the AI 101 playlist up here. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to keep up with my PhD life, and I will see you guys next Friday. Bye!